Ronnie, welcome to Forward Guidance. Hi, Jack. Good to see you. Yeah. For, so for those of you who don't know, Ronnie is a partner at Incrementum AG, also the author of an extremely comprehensive report on gold, In Gold We Trust report. Let's sort of start with, with the macro. I understand that, you know, after the great financial crisis, we were sort of, you know, in a disinflationary era. Central banks were printing money, but it wasn't really getting into the economy. Uh, so growth was somewhat muted. Uh, I understand, uh, uh, Ronnie, that your thesis now is that it, the game has completely changed. COVID was a, a huge game changer, and uh, it, it ushered in something that you refer to as monetary climate change. What do you mean by that? I think it's 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 this big move from from monetary dominance to fiscal dominance. I, I think that um, in the great financial crisis, the the big new thing was was quantitative easing nobody really knew what it was of course the uh the japanese already um uh, uh used it and implemented it before and i think they're now at round number 13 or 14 but they call it qqe so quantitative and qualitative easing um which sounds even more sophisticated but but I think that that central bankers they they kind of um, understood that with simple quantitative easing, which is basically an asset swap, you cannot really create any inflation, and it doesn't have any any direct impact on on the economy. So um, I mean, after the GFC, central bankers never got tired to 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 tell us well inflation is too low we have to do more we have to be more aggressive um to get inflation numbers up now they are significantly above their target rates and and and, and i mean um you know one year ago we we published a special report on inflation that was called uh inflation and the boy who cried wolf back then the cpi in the us was at 1.2 percent now we're at almost seven percent so inflation is becoming a topic again and now you've you 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 asked why what the main difference of this monetary climate change is. First of all, I think that um, that theories like MMT, helicopter money, universal basic income, stuff like that, I think this is really becoming mainstream. Um, and, 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 and this was before the COVID crisis. I think it was, uh, uh, you know, primarily a topic of more left-wing economists sitting in the ivory towers uh, but now it is really becoming mainstream and it's it's not a question of if but a question of when it will be implemented and i think to some degree we already see it then i think those um this this fiscal dominance can be seen you know um the 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 proverbial frugal swabian housewife you know, even in Germany, nobody cares about budget deficits anymore. And and I think the the, the Maastricht criteria, for example, um, it will be renegotiated. So so I think that um, big government is back. I think that's that's a major difference. I think that um, politicians really enjoy being in the driver's seat now and 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 trying to you know to fine-tune the economic cycle and to avoid every recession that's that's a big change then we have seen this move to to credit guarantees which is very very important so uh in the uk for example you had for uh first time house buyers you had the government guaranteeing you uh loans up to six hundred thousand pounds so the risk is being shuffled from 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 the bank over to the government so to society at large basically and and i think the big difference compared to um 2008 2009 is in this crisis m2 started to skyrocket already while uh, during the gfc it was only high powered money so so central bank money going through the roof and basically trying to compensate for this um, uh, credit destruction that we saw. So, so I think there are many, many um, uh, differences. And, and, and as we're seeing now, um, of course, we, we don't believe the narrative that inflation is only transitory. I think it's, it's going to come down the next couple of weeks and months. Um, 
So this will give some leeway to, to, to central bankers probably telling us, well, you know, the whole inflation thing is over. But I think that we will have to get accustomed to inflation rates um, being above the 2%. So so I don't see hyperinflation right away, but I think that 3, 4, 5% inflation rates will become the new normal. And let's face it, you know, during the great moderation for four decades basically of, of, of falling uh, inflation rates most of the investors politicians central bankers um, business owners they don't know how to navigate in the environment of uh, inflation um, so so I think this will um, catch many many people on the wrong foot and and, and 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 I think this is really really crucial to understand going forward mm. And Ronnie, where does gold and Bitcoin play into all of that? Uh, at Incrementum, you recently launched a gold and uh, Bitcoin and I believe silver fund, sort of a hard assets fund to benefit in that environment. Can you walk us through your thinking why, if that environment that you just laid out, if that happens, very high uh, levels of government uh, budget deficits, uh, perhaps very low interest rates as well, or, you know, inflation that is uh, high, inflation expectations that are themselves high, why is that sort of good for, for hard assets like Bitcoin, gold, silver, commodities, and you know, gold miners as well? The short, short answer is because they're not inflatable. Um, so buying gold and buying Bitcoin is the conscious decision to sell dollars, to sell euros and exchange it for something that cannot be inflated at will. So the inflation rate of Bitcoin and of gold is 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 basically the same at the moment it's 1.6 percent so with every bitcoin and every uh, ounce of gold that you own um the natural inflation at the moment is 1.6 percent and it's you know check it's 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 all about relative scarcity in an environment uh in a sound money environment you actually there's no case for for bitcoin probably there's no case for gold but we're definitely not in a sound money environment. So, uh, of course, uh, we, we're seeing the consequences of this, as Ludwig von Mises would have called it, uh, a cracker boom, or, or in German we say uh, Katastrophenhaus, which is a which is a, a beautiful term. And and I think you know the fact that that real estate prices are going crazy, that you know uh, uh, the art market is going crazy, that um, an artist can sell. Uh, an invisible piece of art for 15,000 US dollars um, that bond markets are trading at ridiculous levels. I, I just had a look at uh, Greek government debt, you know, uh, 10 years are trading at 1%, 25 years at, at, at 1.2%. I mean, uh, in Germany, up to 30 years uh, uh, at negative, negative yields. So, I mean, those are all signs that, that we are not um navigating in an environment of of sound money so to come back to uh to bitcoin and to gold um it's a it's a non-sovereign um hedge against the monetary debasement against an environment of of deeply negative real rates it's it's a hedge against ultra loose monetary policy it's a hedge against governments monetizing ballooning government deficits it's a hedge against financial repression so i think most of the problems that we are facing are systemic problems and those systemic problems cannot be solved from from within the system so you actually have um to 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 get a hedge outside of the system and i think that gold and bitcoin help you to to go to the other side so if you think that that money is basically um, some sort of technology, um, money helps us to to save time. It is an abstraction for for for, for time and energy. Um, then I think that that compared to fiat money, that gold and Bitcoin are superior forms of money and more stable forms of money. So you know to 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 answer your question, we think, and 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 I think that not too many people within the gold uh, camp, but also within the Bitcoin camp, we think that it's prudent to to combine both. 
you know, gold for, for stability and Bitcoin for convexity. Of course, the, the track record of, 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 of gold is, is more than 5,000 years. So, so trust comes from repeatedly fulfilling expectations. And I think that gold did a, did a great job also in, in 2020, you know, gold was up 25%. Um, it, it's, it's a bit frustrating this year to, 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 to be honest. Um, and Bitcoin, of course, um, I think there's many, many similarities. Um, Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever it was, I think he, he understood the monetary system. He understood Austrian economics. He understood the stock to flow ratio that, that we wrote about already in our first book, Austrian School for Investors. And, and therefore, I think that, that his vision was really to, to create um, something similar to gold um, in the digital world. And, and you know, with, with the next halving cycle, um, Bitcoin will be harder money than, than gold. This will continue. Um, do I know if, if Bitcoin will be around in 10 years? I've got no clue. I, I think so. I think so. And if it will be around in 10 years, it's probably going to trade at a million or, or, or even higher. But um, there's also a fair chance that it's, 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 it's not going to be around. Do I think that gold will do a pretty good job to preserve your purchasing power, power over the next 10 years? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. But but this also comes with the fact that then obviously um, uh, uh, the upside is, 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 is significantly lower than with a new technology than Bitcoin. So, you know, for us, it makes sense to, to combine both. Um, I know that uh, this is this is something that many people in the gold camp don't like, but also in the Bitcoin camp. You know, as an Austrian, I'm you know, I'm, I'm, I'm spending lots of time in the mountains and I, and I go skiing and I go snowboarding. You know, I go snowboarding mostly off piste <laughs> and I go skiing on the on, on, on the piste, um, which is a good good combination from my point of view. But many skiers hate the snowboarders and the snowboarders hate the skiers. It is what it is. But I think that that both are, are great and I really enjoy both. And it's a bit similar with with Bitcoin and gold. Mm, I like that as an Austrian you like going skiing and snowboarding. And then as an Austrian economist, you like uh, gold <laughs> yeah. and Bitcoin. I'm glad you, you brought up real rates. I think that gets to the um, the heart of the matter because real rates is you know, sort of two things. It's a uh, nominal interest rate, what bondholders get paid in nominal terms. And then it is inflation. So I want to talk about the first uh, inflation first. So as you said, gold had a tremendous year uh, in 2020, particularly until like, you know, April until uh, middle of the summer, that was a fantastic rally. Yeah. Um, but that happened as inflation itself was very low because the world was recovering from the pandemic. And now, uh, inflation, since then, inflation, uh, gold has, I think, you know, underperformed a lot of people's uh, hopes and expectations, even as inflation has been has been risen up. So yeah. uh, if people talk about gold as an inflation hedge, to what degree is gold just extremely early. It's, it's sort of sniffing out inflation before the, the, the rest of the economy sees it. And then by the time inflation's there, uh, you know, gold's looking on until the next two years. Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, that's, you know, check, we wrote, I think, more than, more than 3,000 pages of research over the last 15 years about gold. Um, and I think that, that the direction of, the direction and the momentum of long-term real rates is probably the most important driver for gold. Mm. Um, I think that many people are are a bit upset and 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 you know even angry that gold didn't provide its its role as an inflation hedge. But but my take is that gold is is sniffing out future inflation very very early on, and and as I've said, gold was up. You know, it was up. I think 19% in 2019. It was up 25% in, in 2020. Um, year to date, gold in dollar terms, it's, it's down 6%. In euro terms and in many other current currencies, it's up uh, this year. So um, I think that people shouldn't be too greedy when it comes to gold. And 25% is actually in one year for, for an asset class like gold uh, at 11 trillion. That's, that's a pretty big move. Um, so, so we shouldn't really um, expect Bitcoin-like um, uh, 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 performance uh, from gold. Now, 
I think one 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 more thing that that people tend to forget in May 2019 guess where gold was trading then um th- $1000 1300 um so it went basically from May 2019 until August 2020 from 1300 to new all-time highs at 2070 so that that was a pretty big move and I think that that we now really have to digest this move. Um, you know, of course, it's 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 always in hindsight. It's all it's always easy to come up with s- theories and, and explanations. Um, but I think that that you know, first of all, it, it was the U.S. dollar that 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 was um, um, putting some pressure on the price of gold, especially recently. Then we should not forget that. Uh, when gold made its all-time highs, uh, U.S. 10 years were at, uh, I think, 0.4%. Um, now they are 1.5%, which doesn't sound like a lot, but on a relative basis, that, that's a big move. Then I think um, we are now moving into an environment where everybody believes that, you know, um, this is the, 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 the beginning of the great rate hike cycle and, you know, tapering and now we're going back to 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 monetary prudence and and everything is going to be fine well this will be the shortest rate hike cycle the shortest and the shallowest rate hike cycle ever i mean i I, i'll bet a lot of money on that Uh, why do you say that it's going to be the shortest rating hike cycle you know over the past 10 years there have been a lot of instances where central banks indicate that they will raise rates to a level here and they only get to here why do you think in this particular instance it will be a dramatic instance of that where uh, you know the Fed, the Fed funds rate uh, will not go to where uh, uh, the, the Fed implies it's going to go. Well, first of all, because the Federal Reserve has probably the worst forecasting track record ever. Um, Dave Rosenberg had that that recently, and 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 he he analyzed um, everything back to 2012. It was a total of 110 data points, and he said for the Fed funds rate. Um, the Fed forecasts had an uh, uh, accuracy of 37%. So that's that's not a lot. For core inflation, 29%. For real GDP growth, 17%. So they are usually biased to, to higher fund, uh, Fed funds rate and to stronger economic growth um, than we end up seeing. So, 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 so they 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 always try to sound very hawkish, but then at the end they're extremely dovish. So, right. so this is one thing. Then you know, check we 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 have seen it. You know, if if we would be in a in a solid and healthy monetary system, I mean there wouldn't be any discussion about tapering, about. You know, when is the rate hike cycle going to start? They would just raise rates by, by 50 basis points, yeah? I mean, <laughs> I mean, when did they start raising rates by 25 basis points? It, it used to be 50 basis points uh, or, or, or a percent. So, so I think this is already telling you quite a lot, the fact that the market only seems to care when does tapering start? Will there be two or three rate hike cycles, uh, rate hikes next year? That shows you how dependent we are uh, on low rates and 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 cheap liquidity. And and you know, as far as I know, that uh, uh, debt levels are not down significantly, both uh, on a government level, but also for corporates uh, on a personal level. Um, so. You know, it's 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 fairly easy. The higher the debt level, the the greater the sensitivity to rising rates. So, uh, therefore, I think you know, in this economy that is so heavily financialized, um, I think there's there's no way that we'll go back to um, dramatically higher positive real rates. Perhaps nominal rates will go higher, but real rates will stay negative probably for the next couple of years. Uh, I'm pretty certain about that. And this al- al- already brings me back to gold. I mean, we, we crunch the numbers and negative real rates are the foundation of every gold bull market. The 1980s and 1990s, two horrible decades for gold investors. 
Why? Because we primarily had positive real rates. So if you think that, that real rates will rise significantly, then say goodbye to gold, obviously. I don't think so. Mm. Uh, Ronnie, a little bit of a, of a technical question. To what degree is the gold price predicted by the level of real rates versus the rate of change in real rates? Because I know the, the, neg the tips yield, uh, the, the real rate, has been negative for quite some while, but it stayed negative. And over that period, gold has declined slightly. So is it is it really, you really need that explosive lower uh, uh, level where going from eight to po positive eight to positive five is much better than staying at negative one? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, I think it's it's important to clarify. It's, it's really not the absolute level, but it's rather the direction. Um, so, so in general, I would say that that this inflation is is the worst environment for gold. Um, rising inflation is a positive environment. Uh, deflation, to some degree, is also a, a positive environment. But this inflation is the worst environment. And I think over the last couple of weeks, um, we saw some dif disinflationary moves in markets. Um, which is interesting because uh, Jay Powell now made the U-turn saying, well, you know, inflation, perhaps it's not transitory, while the markets are suggesting that, uh, you know, f at least for the next couple of months, inflation rates will, will probably rather, rather fall. So we saw it with, with most of the commodity markets. We saw it with the gold-silver ratio. We saw it with, with monetary growth coming in lower. We're seeing it as... Um, it seems that we are also tapering into the weakness, obviously. So, so I cannot rule out that we'll have a recession next year. Um, we're seeing it with, with the US dollar being very, very strong, which is also a, a deflationary trigger. Um, so, so, so from my point of view, my, my kind of roadmap is, and this is confirmed by our uh, incre incrementum inflation signal, I think that this inflation panic that we have seen over the last couple of weeks, this will kind of fade. So, so I think in, in spring, inflation won't be such a big topic um, 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 uh, still. And, and this will give central bankers probably some leeway to, to become more dovish again. But I think that, uh, you know, that's, that's also due to the base effect and so on. And I think that, you know, most of the supply disruption that's, that we're seeing, um, they, at some point, you know, they, in, in our system, you know, with entrepreneurial creativity and, 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 and the globalized market, I think those, um, th those issues will be resolved at, at some point. So, so the supply disruptions, I think, will become less and less of a problem. Um, but I think, and, 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 and that's, that's our take, we, you know, this, this, this great moderation is, is over. And I think we, we will have to get accustomed to inflation rates at three, four, five percent, perhaps even higher. And let's face it, this is exactly what, what central bank has always told us. They, they, they told us we need more inflation. Deflation is the big enemy. Now they are telling as well, um, now it's only transitory. It's only because of supply disruptions and so on. Um, but if you have a look, for example, I, I tweeted that out to, to today, this morning, um, um, German power base, lo base load, so the one year forward contract, they're skyrocketing. They were at, at, at 40, 40 euros per, per mega, megawatt hour um, at the beginning of the year. Now they are at 200. And I mean, for, for, for an economy like Germany, it is heavily dependent on, on, on their industry. I mean, that, that's a huge driver. So it will trickle down to uh, producer prices and it will trickle down to, um, to consumer prices. So, 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 so I think, you know, I always said, be careful what you wish, uh, which, wish for. It might come true. Now it's, it's happening. But I think that many or most investors haven't realized that inflation will stay around. And this is also what you're seeing um, if you have a look at longer term inflation expectations. So the market, especially the bond market, still believes that the Fed is right, that inflation is transitory. So for the longer term, it is not being seen as a concern. But I think at some point the market will realize, well, perhaps it's stickier than, than, than everybody thinks. Yeah, so that could possibly, the, the 
relative moderation in longer term inflation expectations that could explain uh, gold's you know relatively tough rough patch over the past year, but also if those if those inflation expect it's like a coiled spring if those inflation expectations shoot higher then yeah. you know the more it's held down that the, the the more explosive it, it could be. Uh, Ronnie, last year in December of 2020. Uh, Fed Chair Jay Powell announced the flexible average inflation targeting regime, which um, simplifying basically said that we have undershot our 2% inflation target uh, over you know the, the past 10 years. And as a result of that, we are going to o- try and overshoot it to make up for that. You had a chart that was so, so pivotal. Um, you have a chart, which it took me about 10 minutes of looking at this chart to finally understand really, really uh, what was going on here. But it's a fantastic chart. It is the mm-hmm. inflation target of, at 2%. And you see the PCE inflation rate has undershot. That's going below the blue, below the 2%. And as such, that you know gives the Fed leeway under the flexibly average in, uh, uh, inflation target to overshoot in the green, as you can see uh, right here. Can, or can you outline like this b- blue patch and this uh, 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 turquoise patch and, um, you know, how that sort of how play out and, and what would happen if the Fed runs out of that budget? Well, well, you know, if we take take a step back and and talk about this concept of flexible average inflation targeting, it means central bankers keep telling us, well, we are really sorry but we devalue, we didn't devalue uh, your purchasing power enough over the last couple of years. We're sorry about that. <laughs> um, but now going forward, we've got leeway to devalue it even more. So um, I think if you think about that concept, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. And, 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 and what's really striking to me, and this is why we, uh, why we prepared this chart, um, you know, the, 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 the framework of this flexible inflation targeting is, um, is not very well communicated. So nobody, nobody is telling us what the time frame is and, and, and for how long inflation rates can actually overshoot. So, so we did like two scenarios, um, starting in 2012 saying well this is our inflation budget and if we use it up until the until the end of next year um so december 2022 then we can be at uh, above five percent the whole the whole year um and if we say well we will use it up uh, our inflation credit only until the end of 2024 we can be at three percent um now you know, I've, I've got no clue how, how, how it's going to turn out. But I think really, if you, if you, if you think about what it actually means, it's, 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 it's pretty striking. And, you know, Jack, what, what, what I really missed um, uh, over the last couple of days is when everybody was talking about the Federal Reserve um, and, 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 and this big hawkish move. Um, I mean, first of all, uh, <laughs> first of all, um, the, 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 their forecast for 2022 um, is the inflation forecast is 2.7% um, for, for next year compared to 2.3% previously. And I already told you before that the track record is not really outstanding. So even if they get the Fed funds rate up to 1% next year, it still will result in deeply negative real rates. So everybody telling me that that they are so hawkish now sorry that's nonsense they're still extremely dovish and if we now compare um this uh the the the, this current tapering environment we shouldn't forget first of all um the fed is tapering now twice as fast uh, as the last time we shouldn't forget that Asset prices are far higher at the moment. You know the uh, the case Schiller PE is at 40, which is um, it, it is 98 percentile. So only in two percent of all instances, um, equity valuations were higher. We know that growth is now kind of decelerating compared to 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 to, to previous episodes. We know that um, that 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 asset markets are 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 
much more important to consumer health than previously. So it's a very much financialized economy where uh, uh, consumer sentiment is extremely strongly linked to 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 um, equity markets and to the housing market. So if we consider that and and also have a look at, at, at the current current market setup, I mean, the, the S&P probably is, is a really bad gauge for for the overall health of, of, of the stock market or our economy. There were some 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 really good studies coming out from from Goldman and Monk Stanley, basically saying that only five percent were were responsible for the majority of the moves in the S&P and also in the Nasdaq. So if you have a look at the broader um, monetary uh, at the broader uh, markets, if you have a look at some some sector indices. They're already telling us, well, there's, you know, there's no market breath uh, uh, anymore. So it's already telling us, well, something underneath the surface isn't isn't going so well. So tapering into this environment um, is pretty dangerous. And and the big question, obviously, is, um, you know, it's 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 a confidence game. How how quickly can can Jay Powell make the make the U turn? Um, now that he moved from from very dovish to um as the market would see it kind of hawkish and you know fighting inflation h- how quickly can he make this this u-turn again over here in the eurozone i mean at least mrs lagarde never even tried to make a u-turn so <laughs> that makes it a bit easier for her um but but that's the big question what will they do if the markets go down 50 or 20 percent um I think the the most important member of the FOMC is the S and P 500, and um, therefore, you know, I mean, what what's left in a toolbox? What's left in a toolbox of the Federal Reserve? Not not too much. So I think that you know, yield curve control will be implemented at some point. I think that the Federal Reserve will buy equities at some point, but I think that fiscal policy will play a much larger role going forward. Uh, yes, central bank girls worldwide are really stuck between a rock and a hard place. One, it's inflation, and there's a lot of political pressure there. And on the other hand, if they are too hawkish and they raise hike rates too fast, they could tank the stock market and and tank uh, economic growth. It's there's a German word, a German word, uh, Zugzwang, yeah. of being forced to act. So that's uh, we covered the Federal Reserve. What's going on uh, in the Bank of England and the ECB? I understand that we're recording this on uh, Thursday, December 16th. We both had an announcement there. Uh, what's going on with their policies and how does that shape your outlook? Well, for the Bank of England, they, 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 they made a right ha- rate hike, I think quite, quite, quite unexpected. Um, for the ECB, you know, everybody is expecting that they will, 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 will start considering some, some tapering. I think it's going gone, it's gone to happen, but it's, it's, it's not going to have a, a big impact because they're so, so way behind the curve. I mean, even in the last cycle, you know, the Federal Reserve at least had some leeway to lower rates. We didn't have them in the in the eurozone, so you know, it it, it just tells me that um, we call it the, the the zero rate trap. We we wrote a book about that, and 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 I think that uh, you know this is playing out perfectly, uh, unfortunately. So um, the big question is, uh, you know. What, what's what's the way out and and probably um, it is it is going to be a combination of first of all fiscal fiscal um, financial repression um, deeply negative real rates um, it will probably we will probably see much more aggressive moves as I've said before um, central banks buying equities um, trying to really influence or um, completely take over the last rest of uh, the, the the last pieces of of, of, of of market forces and capitalism um, so, so this is going to happen but I think that CBdc's will also play a major role going forward and um, and I think you know if, if if you read what's coming out from the Bank for international settlements and 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 uh, uh, the most important central banks CBdc's that use the momentum of of, of cryptocurrencies um, they uh, they, they will be implemented to 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 fine tune the cycle. Um, 
Now the thing about a th uh, about a cycle is you know that it's going up and down and and if you avoid the recession, if you avoid the downturn, you will only make it worse for the next downturn because you know a recession is something normal, something something really really healthy. Um, so uh, as as we're trying to 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 do everything to to avoid bankruptcies and and banks from from failing, I think that that uh, you know the next crisis will probably be worse. And um, if CBDCs will be implemented, I think you know um, it, it. I can imagine, and, and this sounds a bit 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 crazy at the moment, but then you will have your uh, your Fed wallet. And, you know, if, if there's uh, if the economy is weakening, then check you'll get on your Fed wallet um, 5000 bucks, but you will have to spend it. And if you don't spend it, it will be worthless or uh, uh, the value will will decrease by 10 percent every week, something like that. And of course, it will have an impact on the economy. Um, but is this a prudent way to. Um, <sighs> To, to, to allocate capital, I would doubt it. But but I think that really CBDCs are the next big thing, unfortunately. They are the complete opposite of, 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 of Bitcoin uh, because they are centralized. Um, they're, they're, uh, uh, yeah, they're, they're just something completely, completely opposite. But yeah, I think that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Ronnie, now I want to talk about Bitcoin. Let's uh, sort of skip your base case, which you know, a lot of people will be familiar with. Uh, talk to me about the differences between Bitcoin and gold as an investment. We know it's more vo Bitcoin's more volatile. We know it's more convex on the upside and the downside. Does it have the same drivers as gold of you know, negative real rates, uncertainty about the, the future of, of monetary policy, that monetary policy is unsound? Or is there something that's, uh, you know, that's driving Bitcoin, uh, that's a very significant driver of Bitcoin, but that's not driving gold at all? And sort of what's your journey, you know, having been involved with precious metals for so long, um, I'm coming to Bitcoin like so many of us, you know, as, as a, something we've only seen in the past few years or so? Well, well, through, you know, the whole libertarian scene, I... I found out about Bitcoin very early on in I think in 2012 or 2013 and and to be honest back then I I wouldn't have expected to 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 become that that big uh, really it is um, it is really watching watching history happening and 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 I've met so many uh, tremendous people bright young people super ambitious um, you know people seeing only solutions uh, and, and not only problems while you know in the banking world it's um, this this pessimism is is, is is quite frustrating that you're seeing in the traditional um, uh, financial world so, so this is really for me it's been a it's been a great journey now I think you know there's many many similarities between between gold and Bitcoin so it's it's no coincidence um, for example the stock to flow ratio high stock to flow ratio is is, is, is really crucial um, for 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 a solid solid money I think this it's no coincidence that you're mining uh, Bitcoin um, you know you have to put in enormous amounts of efforts to get gold out of the ground I mean here I've got a uh, Solidus coin. Um, um, it's it's more than 1,500 years old, mm. and and you know back then obviously you didn't have the technology that you're having nowadays to to mine, you know, 0.5 grams of gold for one ton of ore. I mean, you have to imagine that 0.5 grams in one ton of ore. How how complex it is, and it's similar with Bitcoin. You know, uh, back in the days when I started, I basically could mine Bitcoins on a on a normal normal uh, PC. Now that's that's completely impossible. Um, I think there's 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 many similarities, and and I think that over the last couple of years, Bitcoin re really grew up very quickly. So it's it's not a kid anymore. It's it's not a teenager uh, anymore. Probably it's it's a 
I don't know, a, a, a young professional or whatever. So, you know, when we started our, our first fund that combines physical gold with uh, Bitcoin in cold storage, where we're using actually the volatility, the volatility is our friend. So we are harvesting the volatility via the options market, um, writing options all the time. Back then, um, it was, you know, we, the infrastructure, the futures market, options market, they, they were really, really, really just getting started. Now this whole market is developing. You've got the, the big guys coming in, which is really odd because normally um, they're, they're, they're talking about smart money and dump money. And at the end of the cycle, there's always the, the dump money coming in, um, which is retail investors. But here it's, it's kind of the opposite because it started with uh, uh, tech savvy uh, retail investors and n only now the big institutions are, are, are coming in. So, so, so I think, you know, um, at the moment, it seems that, that Bitcoin is a, is a risk on asset. I think it was a pretty good leading indicator on the downside for the S&P. We saw that uh, in the end of 2017, we saw it in February 2020, we saw it in August 2020. Uh, it's also a, a leading indicator on the upside. We, we saw that as well. The crash low uh, in March uh, 2020, for example. Um, so, so I think Bitcoin at the moment is more of an indicator for risk appetite of investors but those correlations they 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 they, they can change and and we we as you know we 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 published a chart book uh, uh on bitcoin uh quite recently and it's showing the the rolling correlation between gold and and bitcoin and actually this correlation is over the longer term it's basically zero but then there's episodes where where they're highly correlated and then they're negatively correlated so it's it's changing all the time. It's 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 really fascinating. Um, so, you know, I I have to say uh, I, I really enjoy being in both worlds. I think it's 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 highly rewarding. I think that um, this is something that um, that that I miss at the moment a, a bit. Um, I, I I don't want to sound like a um, old frustrated guy, but I think at the very beginning. Um, when I found out about uh, uh, Bitcoin, I think that most people really understood the flaws of our monetary system. So th they were questioning, what is money? Why is Bitcoin better money um, than gold, perhaps, or, or, or the US dollars, the US dollar? And now over the last couple of, of months, it has clearly become um, an object of, of pure speculation. So, so you know, a bigger correction can happen anytime. Perhaps we've already seen the the, 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 the beginning, um, which will be normal and, and, and just healthy. But I think that in general, um, the fact that so many young people now really um, try to get out of the, 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 the monetary system. And, and, you know, Michael Saylor, for, for example, you, you know, he was, uh, he was on TV a couple of times and he said really, from a philosophical point of view, fantastic things. And, and, and I think this is really spreading like a wildfire. So, so this pure speculation, of course, this is one part of the whole story. Um, thank God it's not, it's not the whole story. Um, but I think that, um, yeah, as I've said, it's, it's a fascinating journey and it's, it's not only Bitcoin, it's the whole, you know, the, 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 the the, the whole um, DeFi space, I think, in, in, in the uh, NFTs are, are fascinating. I To be honest, I don't understand uh, uh, all the stuff that is coming out all the time. It's just so hard to to follow it. But but everybody telling me, um, well, this is just a bubble. I, I'll, I'll keep telling them, well, well, then you say that technology is a bubble and that the digital world is a bubble. If you think that we will go back to, 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 to you know, um, uh, the old world, fair enough, then we probably um, won't need any cryptos. We won't need Bitcoin. But I don't think that we're going to go back. And, and I think that the COVID crisis was definitely uh, also a catalyst for that. You know, we all got accustomed to doing meetings on Zoom. My dad, who is like 75 years old, I mean, 
he he's totally fine with 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 MS Teams with with Zoom calls and so on, and and I think being against um, cryptos would also mean you're against the digital world and you're betting against that, and I just don't, don't see that happening. Yeah. What was the? Uh, by the way, Ronnie, you and me both. Uh, that makes two of us for not understanding NFTs. But uh, the the, <laughs> I did the George Soros quote about like the if I the first thing when I hear a bubble is is I do is buy. Um, but uh, Ronnie, my uh, my final question for you. You've been. Uh, I know you got to go. Very generous with your time. Is because you you took up the the gold coin from the Roman the, the solidus. I got to uh, take up the Latin and ask you. Quo vadis. In other words, where do you think it's going? Uh, so that's gold and Bitcoin. Look, I, no one has a crystal ball, obviously, um, but uh, you and your, your colleague, uh, Mark Valak, have put together a few little probabilistic ranges for outlook uh, for gold. I think it's in 2030, very long term view. And then Bitcoin, I think that outlook may be a little bit shorter. Yeah, well, for, for gold, we've got. Um... We've got a very simple valuation model. You know, I, I, I worked in a bank for a couple of years and I know that there's very, very complex models. Uh, the problem with those models is the more complex they are and the more sophisticated they sound, the less they work. Um, so our our monetary model is, is, is based on trust in the monetary system and uh, the backing of the M2 uh, uh, monetary aggregate for, for, for the United States. So you, you can read um, um, uh, w what's in this model in our 2020 report. And we come up with a, um, with a uh, price target at 4,800 US dollars by the end of this decade, which sounds like, like a lot, but I mean, 1970s highly highly inflationary uh, decade. Gold was trading at at at, at 30 bucks um, in 71, and then it went up to 850. Um, who would have believed that? And we saw the big mid cycle correction from 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 200 dollars down to 100 dollars, and then from 100 up to 800 within four years. So so, so this can happen. And now I think gold is is really some sort of an of an anti bubble. If you multiplied that 25, 30 x gains, that would be something like forty thousand or fifty thousand dollars an ounce for gold. Obviously, nineteen seventies was was a lot more volatile. And then, what were you saying about Bitcoin? Yeah, well, for for, for for Bitcoin, you know, I think it's 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 pretty much binary. And 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 I think it's you know we we we, we know the Lindy effect. We we know what's going on. How how flexible it actually is. How strong it is. Um, how big the, the the community and and the user base nowadays is so i sometimes make the comparison with um with whatsapp um mm -hmm. i mean there was a time when i don't know i think there was mostly in the european union where uh, everybody was really scared you know they, they're changing their their privacy rules and stuff and then at some point so many people said well i'm i'm leaving whatsapp i'm just leaving whatsapp i'm going to signal or to telegram and then many people realized, well, it, it, the, the network doesn't have any any value if there is like only 10 or 15 percent of your contacts on Signal or Telegram. So they came back to WhatsApp. So so I think and, and this is what what Jeff Booth uh, brilliantly described. So I think it really the, the, the next system or the next Bitcoin would have to be probably 10 times more. 10 times better and more valuable to, to the users. And I, I just don't see a competitor at the moment. Of course, it can change, definitely. So if that scenario is right, I mean, if, if gold goes to 4,800 US dollars, that will probably go hand in hand with uh, inflation. That will go hand in hand with uh, deeply uh, uh, negative real rates. Uh, and I don't see Bitcoin not doing very well in that environment. It's it's hard to put on a price tag, um, but but I think you know in ten years from now, why shouldn't we be trading at at a million or something something like that? I mean that sounds like a ridiculous number at the moment, but you know imagine what happened to real estate prices. Imagine what's happened to in the art market. Um, so. Uh, it can happen, and 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 actually, you know, with with just the stuff that is going on uh, uh, this year with with El Salvador, for example. I mean, that's that's one of the most fascinating monetary experiments 
of the last couple of decades. I, I think there's so much going on. I think that at some point sovereign wealth funds or, 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 or even central banks will start buying Bitcoin. So, um, yeah, mm. it's, it's going to be a fun ride, but it's going to be a volatile ride. Yeah, uh, Ronnie, I know you're extremely time pressed. So for this final question, just answer uh, one, the other, or I don't want to answer that. Uh, I recently had a guest earlier in this month, Kevin Muir, describe to me why he was going long on gold, but short on Bitcoin. Uh, on a volatility adjusted basis, uh, which side of that trade, long gold, short Bitcoin, or, or, or long Bitcoin, short gold, and sort of which do you think will outperform over, let's, let's say the next year. So uh, just say gold, Bitcoin, or I don't want to answer tough one i don't i don't want to answer actually you know i think the way we i mean i'm heavily invested in in our funds we've got skin in the game um and and we're just doing both and we're rebalancing between gold and bitcoin uh we're using the options market to 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 gauge the volatility and you know i've, I've been an analyst for too long uh <laughs> um, and it's 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 it, it's tough but i think from a from a money manager perspective i think that's that's the prudent way and and, you know, it's relative to, uh, you know, as I've said previously, I think it's just this 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 competition um, that we're seeing, you know, with, um, who was it, Michael Saylor against, um, who was um, the representative uh, yeah, of the yeah. gold Frank, camp? Frank Justra. Frank Justra. Yeah, yeah. Come on. I mean, do team bitcoin and gold against the central bank i mean that 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 should be the competition <laughs> but not bitcoin against gold i think they're they're friends they're cousins brothers whatever so yeah that's that that's my take on that kevin muir i have to say his 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 newsletter is 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 fantastic i love it it's it's great value so i'm a big fan of kevin yeah uh me too i liked his quote in, in your newsletter um Ronnie, thank you uh, for being so generous with your time. Great to hear uh, your insights. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Uh, people can follow you on Twitter at Ron uh, Striffola and also obviously check out Incrementum AG. Uh, you've got, got the new uh, uh, Precious Metals and, and, and Bitcoin Fund. Also, uh, Ronnie, you and I today, we spoke about a lot of macro high-level themes. We didn't as much get into the chart, so I really urge the audience, we're going to put a link in the description to the chart book so definitely check out those charts. Really um, a lot of uh, things that can be learned from then. Um, Ronnie, thank you so much. And I'd uh, love to have you on again sometime soon. Thank you very much, Jack. Uh, yeah, thanks for inviting me. Happy holidays. Have a good new year. And I'll see you soon. Thank you very much.